If I could just see a truly naked motorcycle, I'd know the answer. The frame is not designed to be strong. It's designed to be stiff. If you ask an engineer to draw precise handling, they'll draw a stiffness-driven structure. Young's modulus is the concept we need. It describes stiffness as stress versus deformation. The weird thing is that when I divide by density, the specific stiffness of steel, titanium, aluminum, even balsa wood, they're all the same. So frame material shouldn't matter. Thin steel tubes leave room for other stuff, but we could get similar weight and stiffness from thicker aluminum or a balsa tree trunk. Stiffly speaking, there's no difference. Until... <whistles> That's impressive. It has been done. Honda built a carbon NR500 back in 1983 and found neither tech nor cost prohibitive. The issue is predictability. Fiber thickness, direction, layup, myriad permutations make for mysterious performance. Honda would spend months fabricating identical frames only to have racers complain that each handled different in different ways. But steel, it's just pipes and triangles. KTM can predict the result of moving each weld and can go from raw material to a track-tuned, replicable part in four days. If our steel skeleton is cheapest, yet fastest in the odd MotoGP race, then we've begun to build a monster. The challenge with piston engines is endurance. And this KL250 is expected to survive 200,000 kilometers while assuming a middling 60 kilometer an hour and a middle 4750 revolutions per minute. That means the engine must survive very near 1 billion punishing reps. And unlike Alex Jones, Kawasaki has the honor to pay up. Success at such dizzying numbers is all about fatigue limit. It's the amount of cycles a material can withstand before an unacceptable drop in performance. Most metals, even expensive ones like titanium, will steadily decline, meaning parts will need replacing, and that's okay for high-maintenance engines like the RC30 with its first-ever titanium con rods. But steel is that weird metal with no fatigue limit. And as long as the engine stress is below this asymptote, steel is immortal. And no wonder our Conrad is steel, the crankshaft is steel, the flywheel is steel, the wrist pin is steel. Only our piston is aluminum because it must reverse direction at 7,000 G and a heavier metal would pull itself apart. And the cylinder sleeve is cast iron, but that's even cheaper. See, galling is when a metal slides, smears, and welds itself to another. And because these piston rings will travel 256,000 kilometers against the cylinder in their lifetime, we need the lowest galling metal, cast iron. Conveniently, iron can even be rebored to resurrect a whole new life cycle. And when the optimal metal is also the cheapest, we have something properly dangerous. Weight savings improve handling more here than anywhere. My suspension is faster pushing a light wheel into traction, and I'm faster turning a light gyroscope. But carbon wheels are like hair implants. The fact that you can knit a dome into existence is futuristically cool until you remember they're for middle-aged men with too much money. See, pro racers do not and cannot use carbon wheels. Not since 1984, when Freddie Spencer's rim detonated so catastrophically, HRC boss Yoichi Oguma had to walk the stands and beg spectators to return the shards of carbon they snatched from the air. Honda finally pieced together what went wrong. Turns out carbon has high notch sensitivity. 
the tendency for an otherwise strong material to completely fail when nicked. What's annoying on the blue line is fatal on the red line, especially since pro racers change tires constantly, so sooner or later, they will ding that carbon rim. But what if we could get nearly as light with cheap metals just by clever processing? Where casting is pouring liquid metal into a grain potpourri, forging is pressing that metal into its final shape with the grain pattern to match. Even aluminum, when forged, can be designed as thin as 7.7 .7 kilograms for a set. And that's within 10% of the carbon chinaware, so it's quick and unkillable. Now, computer numerical control machining takes a billet of aluminum and cuts away everything that isn't the part, a subtractive process. You wouldn't see and see anything large because liquid casting preserves more material. And you wouldn't see and see anything strength driven because forging gives tailored grain. But CNC is suited for slight, high precision objects like this Henson safety razor, which sponsors our video. Pre-pandemic, Henson was a Canadian aerospace machinist, so when the world stopped, they were sitting on the equipment to machine blade exposure down to 0.03 millimeters. Meaning the razor cannot burn too deep and it cannot bend and jitter, causing cuts. Henson even anodizes rather than painting or plating because they wouldn't risk a top coat compromising their insane tolerance. This is an excessively well-machined razor. I like how comfortable it leaves my face, but mostly I get a giggle out of using a satellite-grade object at 6 a.m. Use the promo code FORTNINE to get 100 blades free. You know that sick feeling when you're tightening a bolt and it just stops getting tighter? Metallurgically, I've exceeded the bolt's yield point. Aluminum has a yield strength of just 250 megapascals. Titanium and steel are both stronger at 800, but if an alu bolt weighs five grams, titanium is 10 and steel is 20, so. Okay, aluminum bolts for light body work and for the rest, titanium. But then I remember galling and how titanium galls pretty bad. So tie bolts must be coated in anti-seize. That's a bit precious. Nut polishers will say it's worth it because titanium doesn't rust, but who cares? Galvanic corrosion is the culprit that matters. It's caused by the minute electric current traveling between dissimilar metals from the more anodic to the more cathodic. Sure, titanium heads stay blindingly devoid of surface rust, but it's galvanic corrosion between my aluminum cases and the threads of my bolt metal that gets them stuck. And on the galvanic series, titanium is more dissimilar to aluminum than steel, so tie bolts cause more corrosion seizures. The pursuit of performance keeps bringing me back to cheap steel. Hmm. This feels like steel too. Last principle, steel is five times less thermally conductive than aluminum. Meaning the welds cool slow, giving hydrogen bubbles time to escape and sealing off all porosity. It's perfect for gas tanks. But looking at my own bikes, I see aluminum tanks. They heat up and cool down faster, causing condensation buildup and freezing my thighs, and they cost more. I see plastic tanks. They vaporize gas straight through bubbling stickers and aging brittle, and they cost more. Just in this garage, I see aluminum frames, Nikosil bores, magnesium wheels, titanium fasteners, and I realize I'm the monster. Not for creating this 40-year-old steel that costs $500 and has the power to weight of a Ford Raptor, but for helping create a world that asks for more. It's moving. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's moving. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. In the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be 